Turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to read the uh, first eight verses um, of Luke's book that he wrote as a sequel to Luke. starting in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his sufferings, he showed himself to those men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. A few weeks ago, as, um, as I was reading in, in the book of Acts and thinking about that, that verse, verse 8, where Jesus says that you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses um, to Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth, you know, I was struck by that verse. And I just could not get it out of my mind. I couldn't get it out of my heart that Jesus had given us the power to be his witnesses. Now, I know you already know that, okay? But that is what I want to talk about today. What does it mean to receive power to be Jesus' witnesses? Oftentimes, this topic is raised just before church is going to launch an outreach program. Relax, we're not, re- we're not launching an outreach program. Um, But oftentimes this verse is talked about, okay, we need to rally the troops and we're going to go do this outreach. I'm not certain that Jesus called us to do outreach. I don't see any place in scripture where he says, go do outreach. He said, go be my witnesses. There's a big difference between doing outreach and being witnesses. Think about the verse. To do versus to be. When we do outreach, and I mean, how many people have been involved in some kind of outreach that's Christian outreach? We we all have. Whether it's singing Christmas carols door to door, that's a form of outreach. Or, you know, some hardcore stuff where you go to the inner city and, you know, we know what that is. But whenever you do an outreach, it's, there's, there's always an agenda involved in that. We have a goal. We have a program. We have a means. We're going to do this to this group of people. And oftentimes, you want to go to people that you've never met before because then it's outreach. You know, going to people that you already know, well, that's a lot harder. But when you do outreach, there's an agenda When you are a witness, that's a lifestyle. There's a difference. Outreach is done to people. Witness is done among people. Having an agenda, we treat people like they are a project. We're trying to convince you to do something that maybe you didn't want to do before. Being a witness shares a message. So, you know, we could go on and talk about the difference, but do you, you kind of get the sense that 
that one is exterior, the other one deals with the whole of life. One is something I do, uh, you know, three hours on a Saturday morning. The other one is 24-7 all week long. Jesus calls us to be witnesses, to bring his life that has changed us and to share it with someone else. Not simply to get them to come to a church service, but that they might come to Christ. They might be redeemed, have their sins forgiven, know the joy of walking with Jesus in a, in a, in a, in a group of people, in a community of people. And, you know, when we look at that, that's what our goal is. Some background in Acts chapter 1. Luke is writing to Theophilus. We don't know exactly who Theophilus is. But, uh, you know, we don't know if he's even a Christian or not at this point. But Luke is writing to Theophilus and he's writing a, a account, continuing account. He talked about the Gospels, uh, the, the, you know, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And now he's going to talk about how that life and ministry of Jesus has worked itself out through the church, through the ministry of the church. And, and he's introducing that. And he's saying some amazing things, that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, spent 40 days walking with the, with the disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. Man, I'm jealous. How many people would love to have been there? <laughs> you know, walking with Jesus in his resurrected body, and he's saying, remember when I told you this? This is what it meant. He's like, wow. And he taught them about the kingdom of God. And then, you know, they get to the place where Jesus says, by the way, um, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you receive the fulfillment of John the Baptist's words. John the Baptist says, I baptize with water, but there's one who comes after me who's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. He says, you need to stay in Jerusalem until you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they said, well, this is good. And then they, they asked the question that has been on their minds right from day one. Jesus, are you going to restore Israel now? Because they were still looking at a political reality. You know, Jesus, are, is the kingdom going to come now and be given to the nation of Israel? And Israel is going to be exalted among all the nations of the earth? Is it happening now? We would look at that and say, is he coming today? And Jesus says, no, the days and times, don't worry about that. But he says, this is what I want you to focus on. Verse 8. Referring back to wait in Jerusalem until you're, until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, that is what I want you to focus on as my people, as my disciples, as my church. So I want to look at just that phrase. What does it mean to receive power? What is this power? In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, you know, a verse that, that is often quoted is not by might, not by our might, not by our power, but by the, what is it? By the Spirit, says the Lord. It, that was one of my favorite verses. <laughs> but, you know, the context there is Zerubbabel was governor of Jerusalem. Jerusalem had already been burnt and broken down and, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the temple was broken down and so forth because of the exile. And Zerubbabel came back, you know, 70, 100 years later. And his task was to rebuild the temple, but it was a pile of rocks. And Zerubbabel was looking at this and, and the Lord said to him through the prophet, he says, the task is overwhelming. You don't have the strength. You don't have the ability. You don't have the power to do that. But my spirit will enable you to do that. And then he says, speak grace, grace to it. And grace is God's power in us. And so 
we recognize that every single one of us, if God gives us an assignment to do that we can accomplish, then it's not worthy of him. He usually doesn't do that. If he asks you to do something, it's beyond you. It's beyond me. We do not have the ability to do what God wants us to do in our natural strength and our natural power. We need a spirit. And all the way through the Old Testament, we see illustrations of that. Zechariah is one of them. This word power is defined. In fact, the Greek word is dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. So Jesus said, you're going to receive dynamite when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to get a couple of sticks of dynamite in your back pocket. <laughs> and so we look at that word. That word dynamite means energy. It means power. In some, some respects, it could be raw power. But it also has a different meaning in the Greek, too. It means ability. Jesus said, you're going to receive the ability of the Holy Spirit as my representatives in this world. As Christians, he says, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the ability of the Holy Spirit that's going to come through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that ability will enable you to be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem and ending to the ends of the earth. When we talk about being a witness for Jesus, we can't do it in our own strength. He empowers us. Without the empowering of the Holy Spirit, I mean, you just got me. <laughs> and we got trouble. You know, and, and I suppose you could look at yourself and say, you know, if someone is brash enough to say, God, I got this, sit down, I'll do this for you, man, that's pride. And, uh, and it won't work. When we look at the task of being a witness in born for Jesus Christ, being a witness where you work, you know, and if we say, let's define witness as just being nice and letting people see our niceness, yeah, we can do that. But if we're talking about being a witness is sharing the good news of Jesus and the hope that is within us, most of us get cold palms, right? There's some of us here who say, let's go. I want you to know that it's the power of the Holy Spirit within us that is the witness. He gives us the ability. You know, Matthew chapter 28, another key verse that we all know. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, the great commission. That word authority is related to power. It means, it, it's a different Greek word, exousia. It means power given by authority. It's the rightful use of power. So we've been given power, the ability to be witnesses, and we've given the authority to make disciples. Think about that. We have the power of the Holy Spirit resident within us because we belong to Jesus. And we're able to be his witnesses. And those who respond, you and I have the authority of Jesus to make disciples, to help people come uh, to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ and realize what that means and to see life transformation from the inside out. And, and you know, and all this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus baptized the church and the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, what was the power of the Holy Spirit released in them? Now we know that that day was a pretty exciting day because the Flames of tongues of fire rested on them. They spoke in other tongues, and people heard the, the, the praises of God in the languages of their own native languages as they gathered in Jerusalem. And then Peter, in boldness, got up and preached the first sermon, and 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus that day. Because Peter was such a good preacher? No. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter didn't even prepare the message. 
Some pastors think, well, because Peter didn't prepare a message and, and he preached under the anointing. To preach under the anointing is you don't do any preparation. Well, that, that's not biblical. But, uh, but I want you to see it's the power of the Holy Spirit that was released in Peter and released through the, the, the church community that affected the witness. You see, when the Holy Spirit shows up, he reveals the presence of Jesus in us. And if the, if the power of the Holy Spirit is in our life, enabling us to be a witness, people see and sense the presence of Jesus in us. We need to recognize that. And we need to be in a place where we say, Lord, show your, salt, your, your light through us. Let it be salt and light to the community around us, to the people that we're working with. The Holy Spirit in us can release his ministry to bring conviction of sin to those um, who don't know Christ yet. And that's one of, the, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, we seek to do it ourselves if we're going to share the gospel, right? We want to convince people that they're sinners. Guess what? Don't, don't, you don't have to convince anyone that they're sinners. They already know. They already know. Every single one of us, we know that. So, but it's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction. Knowledge of sin is different than conviction of sin. Conviction of sin is when the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes, just as, as uh, David was crying out in Psalm 38, Lord, I'm undone, you know? My, 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 you know? my bones are becoming like water within me. I can't sleep at nights, you know? People don't want to be around me because I'm just undone. You know, the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon the life of an individual is not something we do. He does. And he's sovereign about that. You know, I, personally, I'd like to see God bring conviction of sin upon every single person I meet every single day. He doesn't do that. We're all at different places. But when you see that, then you know they're, they're ready, their ears are open to hear the message of salvation. And the Holy Spirit also brings a demonstration of the presence of the kingdom. Now, oftentimes, when you look at Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, and it's preached about the day of Pentecost, it always goes into, well, we have the power gifts of the Holy Spirit. And do you know that the, that, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we read about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the, you know, the, 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 the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, um, prophecy, healing and miracles and all those types of things, those gifts are primarily for being a witness to non-Christians. And yet we have kept them and, and hid them within the church. They are primarily to be used as a demonstration of the reality of the reign of Jesus to someone who doesn't know who Jesus is and, uh, and it's the demonstration of that power. Now, let me give you an illustration. Um, first year when I was at my residency for my doctor of ministry class, we had one guy, his name is John. He's from Chad in Africa. And we were talking about strategies for church planting. And, um, and his native language is French, so he's speaking in English. And he took a little bit of time, but he began to share a story. He says, let me tell you what happened a few months ago. And he says, I was in a neighboring village, a neighboring town, and I was at a, uh, you know, they had, they don't have malls, they have open air, um, you know, shops and so forth. And he said, I was in one of these open air markets and I was buying something, but the woman who was running the market, she was sitting down and she wasn't feeling well and she wasn't waiting on me and, and I was getting impatient. I'm saying, you know, uh, so-and-so... I need to buy something. And she says, I haven't been feeling well for the past couple of days. So he says, let me pray for you. And he prayed for her, and she was immediately healed of whatever it was. She was, you know, flu or whatever it was. She felt 100% better. She said, wow, she got up, and she began to wait on him, but she began to tell everyone around her, this man prayed for me. You know, she had said that she had gone to the witch doctor in their town and they hadn't been able to do anything. She wasn't a Christian. And, and, and that healing got her attention. And everyone's gathered around and said, who are you, where are you from, and how did you do that? And, and he said, well, it wasn't me, it was Jesus. We want to know more about Jesus. And he said, 
Come here Sunday afternoon at four o'clock and I'll tell you about Jesus. And he said when he went a few days later on that Sunday afternoon, 40 people gathered. 30 people gave their lives to Jesus and he planted a church. You see, that is the power gifts of the Holy Spirit to be used to open doors. Do you think God can do that here? Do you think God could do that through you? Yes. Because it's not you or it's not me. It's not our ability. It's his ability. It's his timing. It's being able to listen and being obedient to the Lord to say, Lord, how do you want me to be a witness in this situation? The word witness is defined as someone who sees and tells what they see and know. If you see a crime, you can be called as a witness in a court of law, can't you? And you're going to become, you're going to be an eyewitness, and they're going to say, what did you see? Well, I saw this, you know, whether it's an accident or a crime, whatever it is. Um, and you become someone who tells the truth based on what you have seen and you have experienced. Sometimes in a court of law, they bring in what's called an expert witness, someone who wasn't an eyewitness, but because of their experience, they have a whole lot of knowledge and experience along certain lines, and they can bear witness about what they know as a particular fact in the case. Do you know, as a witness of Jesus, his resurrection, we get to share what we know and what we've experienced about the life of Jesus. How many people have an experience of Jesus setting you free from your sin? Yeah. How many people have experienced of God answering prayer, God moving in your life? You have a testimony. <laughs> well, my testimony isn't exciting. I, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't in the gutter, you know, strung out on drugs and Jesus didn't come and instantly heal me. No, no, no. Your testimony is unique to you. Your testimony is powerful. And, and the power of our own personal testimony, how Jesus has changed us and is changing our lives, is so important. The Holy Spirit empowers our testimony. It's not your story that changes somebody's life. It's the Holy Spirit working through what you share bringing that truth to bear in a life of somebody else. I want us to see that. When I was first saved, first of all, I didn't know how I got saved. I just know I got saved. I didn't have a testimony because I got saved over a six-month process. It wasn't a day. Um, and then I got saved into a culture, you know, in college where, you know, Salvation had to be immediate. It was a particular day. It was a time you made a decision. And it's like, I didn't do that. It was a process. And then I said, well, how do I share Jesus with somebody else? And people couldn't tell me. And then, you know, I discovered the four spiritual laws and stuff like that. And when I was in college, we sought to go out and to um, tell other people about Jesus in order for them to make a decision on the spot because of what I said, and I thought, if I get my story down just right, if I get all the facts and if I do it just right, people will give their lives to Jesus. Well, it didn't happen. I don't have a gift of evangelism. Um, so, you know, it was not natural to me. It didn't happen. And, you know, and then you kind of get burnt a few times because they start asking you questions that you have no answer to because I'm just newly saved. I don't know anything in the Bible. And you realize, wait a second. There's something more to being a witness than just simply sharing facts. It's the way we live our lives. It's how we share our story. And, and I began to realize that as I began to tell people about who Jesus was to me, that they were more open to listen to me rather than if I went with a bunch of facts and saying, you need to do this. Because people don't like to be told what to do. To be a witness 
We share what God has done in our lives. And um, every witness has credibility. If you're going to be a good witness, there's got to be credibility, right? You go to a court of law, the um, other attorney is going to try to discredit your witness if you're a witness in a, in a, uh, in a, in a lawsuit or something like that. But if he can't, then your witness is credible and it carries weight. Same thing is true with us, with Jesus. Jesus wants us to be credible witnesses, which means that our life, the authenticity of our life, how we live our life, the character that we have, the honesty with which we share is powerful. You do not, and I do not have to be perfect in the way we live our lives. We just need to be honest. And when we're honest and we share, yeah, God hasn't fully redeemed me in this area. I'm working on that. You know, but I'll tell you, he's faithful. And we bear witness through our own lives to the faithfulness of Jesus to the truth of who he is, to how he's changed us on the inside. And people begin to see that. I tell you, that is powerful. And we need to share it, not just simply people seeing how we live our life, but also with the words that we share. There's power in a surrendered life as well. You know, when our lives are surrendered to Jesus and, uh, and we want his glory more than our protection, we will take risks, and we can talk. Now, um, bear in mind that our goal is not to make people get saved, because you can't do that. But you can talk to people, and you can share, and you can give them truth, and you can allow them to process and that truth and to respond with questions. And... Uh, and when we have a surrendered life to Jesus, there's power in that. If people um, realize they can't make us change our convictions by threatening us or intimidation or by embarrassing us or anything else, they're going to see that there's something authentic to that. You know that in, in this text, what the word witness is in the Greek? It's martia, where we get our word martyr. The word martyr means witness. Now, today, we look at martyr as someone who is willing to sacrifice themselves, their life, their health, their being, for a cause greater than themselves. But in the Greek New Testament, that word simply meant witness. So Jesus is saying, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will have the ability to be my martyrs. And you go, whoa, 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 wait a second. Does that mean that I'm going to die this week? Oh, no, not necessarily. There are people in the world today who are living um, as witnesses for Jesus Christ where it's very, very dangerous and where their lives are literally on the line. And there are modern day martyrs. But we're the same. We're called to bear witness to the reality of who Jesus is. A new way of life. A different way of life. A different way of thinking. And the Holy Spirit has given us the ability to do that. So you look at that and you say, I don't have the ability to be a witness. No, you don't. But Jesus has enabled you. He's empowered you and has empowered me. We can't be a witness without the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus said, witness, our being a witness starts in Jerusalem. Doesn't mean we go get our plane tickets and go to Jerusalem. <laughs> But it starts in our Jerusalem. So I want to ask you a question. Who's in your Jerusalem? Who do you know who needs Jesus? See, Jerusalem is the area closest to us, the, our relational network, people that we know, family, friends, people who live next door to us, coworkers. 
people that we rub shoulders with during the week. Who do you know who needs Jesus? There's a lot of people in Bourne and Falmouth who need Jesus. Pray for them. Ask God to help you be an effective, credible witness to them. Ask God to open the doors that you might have an opportunity to talk about how Jesus has changed you. Everyone's always interested in listening to our stories. That's how easy it is to be a witness. And then let the Lord lead you in that conversation as you talk to other people, giving them the opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit without us doing the Holy Spirit's job. I believe that if we do that, God is going to open up divine appointments, times during the week where we're going to connect with people and we're going to go, oh my goodness, God is moving in this. Look, look this, this, is, this is a perfect setup. And when that happens, remember, he has empowered you. It's his power through us that we can be a witness and that Jesus will draw people to himself. That's doable. That takes all the stress off of us to try to be someone we're not. It takes all the stress off of us to try to know all the answers of every possible question that can be asked, and it's okay to say, great question, I don't know. Let me ask my pastor. In fact, come on Sunday, you can ask him. And we have conversations with people. Look at uh, Acts chapter 4. I want you to see that the early community of believers in the first century, they were witnesses. They didn't simply go out and do witness. They were witnesses. They saw their lives as surrendered and yielded to Jesus. And no matter what the circumstance, they wanted to share the good news of who Jesus was. Now, um, Peter and John had just been beaten for healing a lame man. They had been told, do not preach anymore in Jesus' name by the Sanhedrin. They were released. They came back. They had a prayer meeting with the disciples. And, um, and in that prayer meeting, they prayed this. I want you to look at verse 29. He says, now, Lord, consider their threats. They were said, if you don't stop preaching in Jesus' name, we'll take your life. Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they were just, you know, imagine if the leadership team of this church had been arrested and gone to the police. The police said it's illegal to preach and gather about Jesus. If we catch you doing that again, we're going to arrest you. We're going to throw you in jail. We're going to beat you, and you may even die. And we came back here, and we had a prayer meeting. What would we be praying? Oh, Lord, give us our passports. Get us out of here. You know? They prayed, Lord, you heard their threats. Now give us great boldness to talk about Jesus and give us, by the power of your spirit, the release to be used as channels for miracles and signs and wonders that everyone around would know that Jesus is Lord. Now, that's a challenge, isn't it? And look what happened. Verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That's being a witness. That's what we're called to. That's what we have the ability to do in Jesus. Amen? Let's pray.
Father, we thank you that, that you have called us into your kingdom. And Lord, that it is not our natural ability, it's not our physical strength, it's not our charisma, it's not our ability to speak convincingly, but Lord, it's the power of your Holy Spirit that enables us to be witnesses, that enables us, Lord, to be able to share what you've done in our lives in such a way that it's going to touch somebody else and they're going to see Jesus. Lord, we want your empowerment upon us. Lord, we know that when anyone comes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within them. But Lord, we need to have your spirit come upon us with great power. And we ask for that today, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would empower us, Lord, to be your witnesses as we go about um, our week, as we go to work, as we go to, as we meet customers, Lord, in their homes, as we go to the hospital, as we clean houses, as we, um, as we teach in school, uh, wherever we go, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would give us your power to be your witnesses. Lord, we yield our will to you. And we say, Lord, use us. Show us, Lord, what you're doing in the lives of people around us. Give us the grace, Lord, to pray um, uh, for those that we know who need Jesus. They may be going through difficult things or not. It doesn't matter, Lord. Give us the grace to be able to pray effectively. Show us, Lord. Put, it, it, imprint upon our minds the people that you want us to intercede for. Because, Lord, you've called us to be your witnesses. Lord, we've seen you heal people. We've seen you answer prayer this past year in some remarkable ways. Lord, we believe that you can answer prayer in terms of people coming to put their trust in you. So use us, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Our blessing um, as we leave is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And uh, this really talks about our identity in Christ. And, um, you know, when we are secure in our identity in Christ, then we can receive the power to be his witnesses. And, um, and Paul writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavy in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He has blessed you with every blessing, every grace, every empowerment, everything that Jesus has has been made available to us. So go in his name. And let's, let's serve him for his glory. Amen.